Hi everyone, welcome to another Sportfish video and I'm very happy today to be joined by Mr. Mark Billsby from the Atlantic Salmon Trust. Mm. Uh, Mark, thank you for having me in this beautiful part of the world. It's fantastic. Well, we're up on the Trim, uh, tributary of the Spey, uh, just getting ready for the third and final year of the Murray Firth Tracking Project. Fantastic. I know that's a big part of what you guys have been doing over the last few years. So I do want to ask you a little bit about why we're here today. Uh, we've been watching some of the guys uh, from the Spay Fishery Board installing a, a smolt trap. But uh, firstly, for, for people who, I mean, I think a lot of people probably are aware of you guys now, but for those who aren't, what can you tell us a little bit about the work that you're currently doing and, and why that's so important? Okay, the, the Atlantic Salmon Trust is a research organisation, we're a charitable organisation and our aim is to provide that information to help conserve and restore salmon stocks so that are healthy and have a viable future. The problem we've got at the moment is over the last 30, 40 years, salmon numbers right around the whole Atlantic um, have gone from eight to 10 million um, fish in the sea down to about two and a half, three million more recently. Mm. And that decline's not showed any signs of slowing. So we need to find out where they're going wrong and more importantly, what we can do to help restore those salmon stocks so we've got viable populations for the future. Yeah, absolutely. We, we had a little chat earlier and I said, there's so many people out there who, you know, involved with salmon fishing or salmon conservation in some way. And there's, there's so many ideas about, out there about what's going wrong, what the problem is. But what you said to me is how important it is to actually get hard evidence. And that's what you guys are working on and why why we're here today. Remind me of exactly where we are, Mark. Well, we're, we're, there's no shortage of opinions. And, and if, you want, if, you, if you want to affect change, you can't just be angry. You need to get out there, get the evidence to inform the policies, inform the local river managers, the mm. likes of the different fishery boards and trusts that are out there who are looking after these rivers and give them the information they need to best look after fish stops. Yeah, exactly. And you need that hard evidence to go to government or policy makers, as you say. Yeah, if, um, we, if we just rock up with an opinion, we'll be, we'll be laughed out of the building. So you need, yeah. to, you need to put forward a case. Um, you need to be the good evidence. It needs to be accessible. It needs to be robust. Yeah. And it needs to be done open and transparently with them yeah. um, to take, take them with you along that journey so they understand the results, the implications, and then they can weigh up the pros and cons of the different actions that they need to take. Mm. So. Um, I mentioned that we've been watching the, the guys from the Spay Fishery Board installing a, a smolt trap just upstream from uh, where we're standing here. I'm going to have a chat with Roger from the Spay Fishery Board a bit later but um, to, to see how those guys are, are collaborating with you. Uh, but one of the big things that, are, that you've been working on in recent years are, are, are the smolt tagging projects. Yeah. Uh, you recently launched, I think it was last year, the West Coast uh, tagging project. But here today we're on a tributary of the Spay, so, so this is obviously flowing out into the Murray Firth, that's your, your ongoing East Coast project. What can you tell us so far about um, where that project is and, uh, and why we're here today with this smolt trap, get, trying to get more information? Okay, well, um, the, the whole essence of the Murray Firth is to take a, a seven rivers right around the whole of the Murray Firth. Um, and you need seven rivers because you need, you need to tag um, a lot of smolts to get numbers of fish going down the rivers and out to sea. Mm. And it's a three year project. And in our first year, we wanted to find out where are the fish dying? Are they dying in our rivers or are they dying in that early part of their journey at sea? And so we followed the fish down the rivers um, from the seven rivers and out to sea for the first 60 to 100 kilometers, depending on where um, the river came out. Mm. And what, what we found is that the vast majority of fish were going missing in fresh water. Right. Okay. So the second year of the project, which we undertook last year, was to start to understand why are they going missing? What are the suspects behind the loss of these fish? Is it a true loss? Is it something that's always happened? Is it background losses? What, what's going on? Because if you, if you want to manage it, you need that hard evidence yeah. to affect the change. And so we, last year we were looking at where are the fish going missing and why they were going missing. And we're starting to see that there's, um, in open run rivers like where we are on the Spey, that there's, there's a a general slow loss of fish as they go down. They go missing as they go down. Um, but where you have barriers to fish migration, such as a weir or a dam, you're getting really high more losses of fish. Right, okay. And that's either because um, 
fish are losing their way. It's because they could be getting eaten by so a congregate, an un unnatural congregation of, of prey. Yeah, they absolutely. Become. Absolutely. So if you if if the fish get held up, the predators can lock onto them, and that's the end of yeah. them. Yeah. Or it could be us looking after them, or it could just simply be one of those facts that yeah. we've just always had. So really, that's what we identified last year, and as we go into this year it's to really understand that. So if, if it is a predation issue surrounding some of these man-made structures, then how much of it's down to the obvious predators? I mean, we all see the fish eating birds and we see them eating smolts. Yeah. And it's really, really obvious. And you could probably go, why on earth do we need a research program for that? But you need to quantify that. You need to understand it. And you need to see how that's impacting upon the population. You also need to have a look at the predators that you can't see. You know, the pike, the trout that are living in these waters mm. and are pretty effective predators of a young salmon smolt mm. as it's going downstream. And so we need to understand that. We're quite a way up this tributary of the Spey. And uh, as we mentioned earlier in the video, we've been watching the guys from the Spey Fishery Board install a smolt trap. For people who aren't so familiar with how those work, what can you tell us about how that's going to help you get the evidence and also why we're doing it at this time of year? Okay, so we're trying to intercept um, the young salmon. Uh, they spent the first one, two, three, maybe even four years of their life in, the, in these headwaters of these rivers, growing uh, until they make that decision, it's time to go to sea and become a smolt. And we're intercepting them on the way down the river. And we're using um, screw traps uh, here on the spay. And it's basically an Archimedes screw mm. that slowly turns in the water and sieves the fish from the water and holds them in a big holding box at the back of the trap. So then the biologists can come along. The fish are in good condition. And then we can take them out and tag them with an acoustic tag that emits a ping, which we can then follow as they go down river and see where, where are they going missing. So it's ahead of that smolt run coming down. All these are being, and, and this is not by any means the only one, there's, the, these are being installed all over yeah. uh, Scotland's rivers at the moment, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, there's a whole network of these. Um, so in, last year we had seven on the Murray Firth, there's four going in this year, combination of those and different types of um, fish traps that have been put, put in place just so you can get the fish. Mm. You know, you, first of all, you need to catch yeah. a fish. Yeah. And, um, it's, it's then being able to do that in a way that's as kind as possible to the fish. We yeah. want to tag fit and healthy fish so they can tell us what they're, what's, what's going to be, what they challenges they're facing mm. as they go down river. Yeah, I mean, you were telling me a little bit earlier about how well managed and how careful and how sanitized that sort of process is. But what sort of struck me chatting to you was actually the amount of different people an effort that is required to get a smolt, put a tag in it, and then get some results. I mean, there's a huge, there's a huge bunch of people that, that yeah, you this, work with. This isn't just an Atlantic Salmon Trust or a Missing Salmon Alliance project. This is the whole community coming out. You've got the Spay Fishery Board here on one of the rivers. We're working across about 15 trapping rivers this year and you're seeing there's half a dozen people here putting in the fish trap they'll be running a team of two to three staff to take the fish and to tag them they'll be supported by people from glasgow university and ast staff you know it's on top of that you've got the volunteers and this is this is going to be going on seven days a week for the next six to seven weeks and it is a monumentous effort yeah. to really understand what's happening to this fish because all of us are joined because we care deeply and passionately about the future of salmon. Yeah. And they're seeing it as a way to, how, how they can understand what's happening to the fish so they can look after them better. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for inviting me here to see this happening yeah, today, Mark. Um, how, how best can people support the work of the Atlantic Salmon Trust? So it, it's to get involved. And um, one of the biggest challenges that salmon face is apathy. Mm. So, so we need to support, we need to support um, people like the Atlantic Salmon Trust. Um, we also need to support the boards and the trusts on the ground um, because they're on the ground, we're coming and helping them yeah. and, it, and it's getting that collective effort. It's getting involved and as, as I said earlier on, it's no use just being angry about all of these different things. If you want to affect change, overcome the apathy, get involved and come out and 
come out and join us uh, in what we're trying to do through the Missing Salmon Alliance and the Atlantic Salmon Trust. So I'm happy to now be joined by Roger Knight, who's the director of the Spay Fishery Board. Roger, thank you for coming along. Great pleasure. Uh, thanks for inviting me on this day to, to watch your guys at work. Um, Good to see you here. What can you tell us about the, the sort of people that you bring together and in the way that you work with people like the Atlantic Salmon Trust to make stuff like what we've seen today possible? Well, we're one of the larger fishery boards in Scotland, but we're still actually quite a small team. And behind us here, we've got our research team working closely with our fisheries officers, formerly our water bailiffs, and they're assembling the rotary screw trap as part of the Murray Firth tracking project. So we have a small team that is multifaceted, multi-talented, that can come together at times to enable projects like this to actually happen. It's been fantastic to see it and actually to see how much effort goes into just taking a screw trap from the back yeah. of a truck to there. But my goodness, there's a lot of people involved. Um, something that, that uh, I was speaking about with Mark uh, was all the, obviously why we're here today, all the, the challenges that, that salmon face. Yes. And, uh, and barriers and obstruction is obviously an important one for, for a migrating species. Indeed. Um, I mentioned to you, just earlier that I love fishing this bay. It's, I, it's the best salmon river in the world it as is, far as I'm yes. concerned for the history and the way it fishes and um, and I've fished it for many years but I never really associated the spay catchment with dams and obstruction like I would for maybe other catchments. So um, seeing your uh, release the spay campaign, yep. which has been very prominent <clears throat> online, uh, has been a real eye opener. Um, what can you tell us about about that campaign and also the, the, the challenges that the spay catchment faces in terms of those obstructions? Indeed. Well, the River Spey, as you rightly point out, is world renowned for its salmon fishing and yet few people recognise that it's actually one of the most heavily abstracted rivers in Scotland. And we commissioned consultants a couple of years ago to revise a report they had previously done in 2008 about the level of water abstraction from the catchment. And what that showed is that of the 51 sites from which the Spey has uh, water diversions, water abstractions taking place, many of which are uh, for whiskey distilleries who borrow the water for cooling purposes before returning it to the river. But they showed that from the 51 sites involved in water abstraction, just two of them account for 91% of all the water that is taken away. Wow. And that 91% is taken from the top 13% of the catchment. And this is water that Which is... Which I'm guessing is a very important part of the catchment it for is access. It's hugely important. It's the headwaters of the, of the spay. Uh, and it's taken from the areas that really are renowned for us uh, spring salmon spawning. Mm. And that water is diverted out of the catchment, not to be returned again, to generate hydroelectricity. A major proportion of it is taken from Spey Dam mm. uh, near Lagan and is diverted to Fort William, where it generates hydroelectricity to power an aluminium smelter at Fort William. But here on the River Troim, this river is also abstracted further up behind us, together with the River Tromi, which is about five miles uh, behind you, uh, running roughly parallel to this river. And of all the water taken away from the Spey, up to 25% of it is taken from these tributaries, as well as the River Kewick, into Loch Erich as part of Scottish and Southern Energy's Tummel Water Scheme. Mm. And that is generating hydroelectricity in the Tay catchment. It's actually some of Scottish and Southern Energy's most valuable water because when they take it from these upper tributaries of the Spey, it passes through seven power generating stations. However, it is taking a significant amount of water from the top of the catchment, together with that taken from Fort William. And crucially, what we have found it is doing is it's having a devastating impact on the River Spey catchment below. Because over the eight decades that these schemes have been in place, they have denuded the groundwater resupplies of the Spey from being topped up. Right, okay. Now, these are 
are groundwater supplies that in times of low flows help top up the river and sustain it. So it's been that, that actual groundwater has been depleted to a level that it's not able to easily refill streams in low water? Absolutely. Right. And it, these groundwater supplies are not easily topped up. It's not as though a few days rain will make everything all right again. Mm. The, we're talking about decades of abstraction that have gradually denuded the flows. And what is really worrying, Jonathan, is that the climate change projections that we've seen show that the long, hot, dry summer that we had in 2018, mm. which saw, saw the River Spey drop to levels last, last seen in uh, the drought of 1976, mm. those are forecast to happen every other year by 2050. So we have a real climate mm. crisis confronting us. And what we have done recently is launched a Release the Spay campaign where we are lobbying the government and their agencies, particularly the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, to ensure that more water is released down our upper tributaries instead of being diverted out of the catchment mm. to generate hydroelectricity. Yeah. And we hope that by doing that, we can make these tributaries and in turn the River Spey down below them more sustainable and more resilient to the climate and biodiversity crises confronting us. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, all credit to you guys for, for your, you know, your online presence and sharing that message, because as I said, I was quite ignorant to it, but um, it's, it's a fantastic campaign and great to get the message out there. For people who want to read a little bit more about that yeah. or, or find a way that they can support the work that you do and, and your partner organisations, yeah. where should they head to? You can look at our website. We've just launched a, a, an excellent new website, uh, River Spay. And uh, from there, you can see the reports that we've had commissioned and get details about the Release the Spay campaign that we've launched. We've generated tremendous following for Release the Spay on social media. Within a matter of days, we'd reached 26,000 new followers who, like your good self, mm were unaware yeah. of the issues that we're facing here with, with water abstraction. Yeah. And we're shortly going to be launching a fundraising page within that where people will be able to support our campaign and enable us to take it to the next level. Great. Well, that's excellent. And we'll be sure to uh, spread that message on our uh, platforms as well and, uh, and hopefully make some headway. Uh, Roger, thanks very much for inviting me Great down pleasure. today and, and letting me see uh, the work that you guys Good are doing. Good to see you. Thank you for coming.